Good afternoon. It's a great honor for me to be here. Uh, before I start, I also want to thank Professor Bakken, who made AMS possible. So, I have a long career in collaboration with Aachen. I started my career in DAISY. At that time, there were only 10 physicists. The cost is quite small. After more than half a century, the physicists have grown <coughs> enormously, and the cost also. <coughs> So, as Professor Scheer said, since the last 20 years, on the uh, lab, on the space shuttle, on the space station, I have been collaborating with Aachen. First Institute, in particularly in, in lab and first uh, flight, both First Institute and Soros Institute, and I'm also very happy to see Professor Habecker is here. My work began in Hamburg on the measurement of size of electron. Quantum electrodynamics says the size of electron should be zero. But uh, and the, the theory agrees well with, with electrodynamics until a, a two independent experiments, one by Harvard, one by Cornell, shows the measurement compared with QED on photon produced electron positron pair shows a violation at a distance of 10 to the minus 13. And uh, in the early 60s, this was a major issue in physics because two independent experiments shows quantum electrodynamics is not correct. At that time, I just began my work. And so I went to Hamburg. We, together with a group of physicists from Hamburg, and we did quickly experiment, showed the measurement compared with QED completely agree with each other. And that was the time I began to meet Klaus Rupersmeyer and Wolfgang Powell, and those people at that time working with Jurich. And <coughs> Klaus shared a beam with me in Hamburg, and he did a very important experiment on photo production of pi mesons. So I have known this great place for a long time, and this is the first time I have the pleasure of visiting. So the International Space Station has a dimension of 109 meters by 80 meters, weighed 420 tons, the cost is 10 to the 11 dollars. And uh, the lifetime 
is for 20 years. So AMS will be on the space station for the, its entire lifetime. So it has, has a size of five meter by four meter by three meter, weighed seven and a half tons. It is a unique experiment on the space station conducting particle physics research in space for the next two decades. It is an international collaboration involving many, many institutes, many, many countries. Of particular interest is the missile designers in China and the missile designers in Taiwan both work in this experiment. And I'm pleased to, um, to remind you RWTH is one of the founding members of AMS. How do you look at AMS? The cost of a space station is about 10 times the cost of LHC. LHC has four very important experiments. On the space station, there's only AMS. It is a TEV precision multipurpose spectrometer. Particles and nuclei are defined by their charge, Z, and energy, in this case, is equal to momentum. So this is a magnetic spectrometer. On top is transition radiation detector, TRD, identify positrons and electrons. Then there are two layers of time of flight counter, measure Z and E. A silicon detector, there are nine layers of silicon detector, measure Z and momentum. and magnet measure charge of Z. A ring image chunk of counter measure Z and E. Electromagnetic calorimeter measure electron positron and gamma ray. Therefore, Z and P are measured independently by tracker, ridge, time of flight, and echo. How do you evaluate the fundamental science on the international space stations? <laughs> idea is very simple. There are only two kinds of cosmic rays traveling through space. Neutral cosmic rays, light rays, and neutrinos. Fundamental discoveries has been made. In fact, over the last 50 years, most of our work in space has been from study of light rays. Charged cosmic ray, following the pioneering experiment, with balloons and small satellites using a magnetic spectrometer on the space station is a unique way to provide precision, long-term measurement of charged cosmic rays. Precision and long-term is the key to the purpose of this experiment. As uh, the previous speaker has very elegantly mentioned, if the universe comes from a big bang, and the beauty of the accelerators is try to go to the beginning of the big bang and try to find why antimatter is not in our galaxy. What we want to do is to look whether there's antimatter or not. For us on the space station, for to 10 to 20 years, we will search for the existence of antimatter to approximately 1,000 megaparsec. There's no antimatter in our galaxy, but the universe has uh, 10 to the 8 or more galaxies. As has been said, since matter and antimatter has opposite electric charge, you need a magnetic detector to measure the charge of antimatter. Cosmic antimatter cannot be detected on Earth because matter and antimatter will annihilate each other in atmosphere. Now, to <coughs> provide a sensitive search for antimatter, like ant helium to antihelium, to the sensitivity of one part in 10 to the 10. 
the first thing you need to do is to have minimum material in the detector. So the detector does not become a source of large angle scattering. And so a positive particle does not scatter in your detector, become a negative particle. One part in 10 to the 10 is a very small number. Then you also need repetitive measurement of the momentum to ensure particles which, which had a large angle scattering are not confused with the signal. And this is why you have nine layers of, of detector, so the top part and bottom part must match each other. So you want a precision detector, but you also want to make sure there's a minimum amount of material. Another physics example is to search for the origin of dark matter. We know 90% of the matter in the universe is not observable, therefore it's called dark matter. A galaxy, as seen by telescope, look like this, we're all familiar with. If you could see dark matter in the galaxy, then the galaxy may look like this. Collision of cosmic rays will produce positrons. Collision of dark matter will produce additional positrons. These characteristic additional positrons can be measured very accurately by AMS. In order to have a sensitive search for the origin of dark matter, to search for positrons, of course, you must reject proton background. You need to reject better than one part in a million. The transition radiation detector rejects positrons, uh, reject protons larger than 10 to the 2. The electromagnetic calorimeter rejects positrons larger than 10 to the 4. To have a very sensitive search for positrons, to measure positrons, you must have minimum material in TRD and time of flight so that a detector does not become a source of positrons. A proton doesn't suddenly change itself to a positron. <coughs> you need a magnet to separate TRD and ECO so that positrons producing TRD will be swept away and not enter into ECO. And so you also need to match the momentum of nine tracker plans with equal energy measurement. Since there has never been a large mag magnetic spectrometer in space, one of the reasons is a magnet in lower Earth's orbit will always point itself to the north. And so if you are not careful, your space shuttle will lose control. And so we have designed a magnet. It does not rotate. And so but NASA decided they really shouldn't trust physicists. So they told, told us, look, why don't you have a test flight first? And so this is a test detector. And put on the space shuttle. And so it was approved in 95, assembled in 97, and sent to space in 98. For the first flight, we built 10 magnets. Seven magnets were used to understand the field calculation, field leakage, and dipole moment. Then we built three full-size magnets. One is to do acceleration and vibration tests, and second is to understand at what condition this magnet will break apart. Because if the magnet will break apart on a space shuttle, it will not be very good. It has 4,000 parts, and the shear force is 4 tons. And third is a flight magnet. Afterwards, our successful flight of first magnet, we were just in the process of building our final detector. Then there was an uh, accident of a space shuttle Challenger. 
not Colombia, then United States decided uh, to stop all the space science experiment on the space station. But we were in the middle of finishing our experiment. And NASA decided to remove us from the shuttle manifest. Uh, everybody else uh, stopped their effort, and we thought maybe we should continue. He was ultimately restored in January 2009 on the manifest because of the strong endorsement of science from reviews by world's leading scientists. And we obtained unanimous support from the United States Senate and House, and also worldwide support from DIR, from Aachen, from ETH, and from Italy, from NASA itself, from DOE, from MIT, and so forth. This is uh, Senator Nielsen, the chairman of the Committee on Science and Space of the United States Senate, made a special visit to our assembly area. Professor Scheer was explaining to him the intricacy of the TRD. And then we had uh, Dr. Bernard Acquier, the president of the French National Assembly, Giovanni Bignami, and uh, your successor, Johann Dietrich Warner, and uh, from the head of the German Space Agency, also from the Spanish. In the 2008, in the presidential election, this issue of AMS suddenly came up. The Obama support, the ex extension of authorization soils for US capability, and he also favored funding one more shuttle mission to deliver the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer to the International Space Station. So, unfortunately, it became a, 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 a major issue. So finally, there was a unanimous <coughs> legislation by the United States House and the Senate in 2008, H.R. 6063, said additional fly to deliver the alpha magnetic spectrometer and other scientific equipment and payload to the International Space Station. Because it was a unanimous decision by, two ho uh, by House and Senate, okay. so President Bush, on October 15, 2008, signed H.R. 6063, into law. And to uh, the best of my knowledge, this is the first time a small little experiment involving such a big doing from both House and Senate and White House. Many people supported us, including Steve Hawking, who made a special trip to come to CERN. Mm -hmm try to understand what we're doing, what are our sensitivities. So the magnet was designed in the United States, manufactured in China, and that's because most the best permanent magnet material come from Inner Mongolia, which is, is part of China. The magnet has 4,000 pieces, and it's arranged such that the field come from two closed loop. In this way, this looking from outside, this cancels this, this cancels this, this cancels this, this cancels this. And therefore, there's no torque. And no field leak out of the magnet, and there's no iron. A detailed 3D mapping with 120,000 locations was performed in May. It was found the deviation from the 90s, from 12 years ago was less than 1%. So the magnet is stable, will be there for 20 years. 
The installation of the permanent magnet was done quickly but accurately not too far from here. Since cosmic ray goes in all directions, a precision veto counter allow you to only accept up and down particle. And this is precision veto counter was quite difficult to make because we require efficiency of one part of 0.99999. The transition radiation detector was mostly done in Aachen. It has 20 layers. Each consists of 20, 22 millimeter of fiber and six millimeter diameter straw tubes filled with xenon and CO2. And they're made of straw tubes. 9,000 were made, 5,000 were selected. They are two meter in length, and the centered to 100 micron, verified by CAT scanner. And this is a group of people from Aachen who took about 10 years effort to finish this detector, which turned out now a major important detector on AMS. Silicon tracker has a coordinate resolution of 10 microns. The mechanical part takes 50 engineers three years to complete because the accuracy we need is 10 microns. And there are nine planes, about seven square meters, 200,000 channels, and with a laser alignment system developed originally by Professor Vara from First Institute, it enables you to align it to three microns. We have a ring image trunk of counter, has 11,000 photosensors, and when a particle goes through the radiator, it leaves a trunk of ring. The thickness of the ring is a measurement of Z. The radius of the ring is a measurement with rigidity or momentum. An electromagnetic calorimeter has 50,000 optical fiber, one millimeter in diameter, distributed uniformly in 600 kilogram of lead. This enable you to measure energy with 3% resolution of electrons and gamma rays up to one TeV. Electronics is a difficult part because you want high reliability and you want it to be very fast. In fact, the, the one we finally choose is about 10 times faster than the current commercial space electronics. We want to be able to measure coordinate to 10 microns. We want to be linear to measure the energy to accuracy from, from 10 MeV to 1 TeV. The major problem is to select the components. What is the radiation effect on the components? Let's say if you have a radiation tolerant IC circuit, when a heavy, heavy ion goes through, it doesn't produce a current. And therefore, this is OK. But if it's a radi radiation sensitive component, and then it will produce a current. And uh, you, you, once you have a current, you can have a bit flip. A uh, logic state is changed. Or a laptop, the IC circuit are damaged. And therefore, select the component. It's uh, extremely important. You need to remember, once this is in, is in space, if something goes wrong, you cannot send a graduate student to fix it. <laughs> and so what we have done is to perform extensive radiation tests to select components that tolerate radiation. We spent enormous amount of effort in Darmstadt because they have a very good heavy ion accelerator. We did some work in Palermo, in Indiana, of course, at CERN. After that, the electronics and the entire detector was sent to Holland to the European Space Agency Electromagnetic Interference Chamber to make sure all, all detectors are not interfered with NASA 
electronics. And then we went to European Space Agency's thermal vacuum chamber for four, 14 days, where the vacuum is 10 to the minus 9 bar, and the ambient temperature goes from minus 90 C to plus 40 C to make sure the detector functions properly. And this picture was taken when there was no vacuum, otherwise these two would not be there. <laughs> <coughs> After that, we brought the detector back to CERN. Before we went there, we tested. After we come back, we tested again to make sure nothing has changed. Indeed, the coordinate resolution is still 10 micron. The velocity measurement at the speed of light is one part in a thousand. The electromagnetic calorimeter prov provides energy measurement of 3% from 10 GeV to 300 GeV. The TRD proton rejection at 400, at 400 GeV at 90% electron efficiency is uh, better than factor of 100. So the combined positron proton separation is one part in a million or more. Once the detector was built, Originally, we're going to take it apart and put it on a 747. And then we realized that probably is not a good thing to do because we have 200,000 channels. And so uh, went to the Air Force and borrowed a C-5 from the US Air Force. Unfortunately, the chief scientist of US Air Force is a physicist, and physicists know by then, everybody know what AMS is, and so quickly they loaned us a C-5 and sent it from the United States to Geneva on August 25th. This is an awfully large airplane. And my good friend Klaus Lubesmeyer, this is inside the C-5, organized the details of a very complicated logistics transport housing to Kennedy Space Center. And since uh, this is such a large airplane, it's hardly seen in Geneva, and so it appeared in the front page of local newspapers. <laughs> Once in Kennedy Space Center, the most important thing we did was to put AMS on a space station mock-up to make sure everything fit. Because if you don't do that, once you're in the space station, if it doesn't fit, it will not be very good. At the same time, the space shuttle Endeavour was transferred to the vehicle assembly building and put on solid rocket booster and the liquid tank. And I think it was March 16th, to, uh, 2010, at night, it was transported to the launch pad. And so this is uh, AMS in the space shuttle. The space shuttle actually is quite big. It's about five stories high. And, and this is uh, the day before the launch. The doors were closed. The six astronauts went to the launch pad. As Professor Scheer had mentioned, it was launched on May 16th, early in the morning. During the launch, the total weight of the entire system is 2,008 tons. AMS weight is 7.5 tons. It takes enormous amount of fuel to transfer us to space station. So after two minutes and three seconds, a thousand tons of fuel is spent. Of course, if you think about it, you want to carry a lot of fuel, but you want to spend it as quickly as you can because fuel is also a weight. And then you want to, to take eight more minutes before the liquid uh, oxygen and hydrogen are spent and before we went to space. And then 
and the Endeavour approached the space station two days later. And this is uh, the astronauts in the, in the space shuttle gradually approaching the space station. And once the dock with the space station uh, arm pick us up, by then, of course, there's no more weight. <laughs> and uh, then it was installed on the space station at uh, 5 a.m. After four hours of, uh, I will say, rather nervous check, and we start taking that. We didn't find anything wrong, and four hours later, we begin to collect data. For operation, there's a flight operation and ground operation. The data goes directly to a Tetra satellite. And then there's a KU, by, KU, KU band, high rate, 10 megabit per second, goes to White Sands Ground Terminal in New Mexico, go to Marshall Space Center, then go to the AMS Payload Operation Control Center at CERN. In addition, in the la almost in the last minute, we decided to put a computer into the crew quarters and train the astronaut to operate this computer. And this has an advantage in case this communication breaks down, we can store data for two months. So now every astronaut on the space station knows how to operate our computer. And then they also can transmit by satellite to the ground station. For operation in space, thermal control is the most challenging task in the operation of AMS. The thermal environment on the International Space Station is constantly changing due to the solar beta angle, position of radiator and solar panel, and attitude. So what is a beta angle? Beta angle is the space station orbiting plane and uh, the sun redirection. And so this is the orbiting plane. This is the left side, this is the right side. So when beta is negative, sun is on this side. So this side is hot, this is cold. When beta is on top, top is hot, the rest are cold. Remember, you are in vacuum. And when beta is positive, this side is hot, these other two sides are cold. Another thermal variable is the radiator position. The radiator, of course, reflects the heat onto AMS. Day and night is only every 90 minutes. Also, when there's arriving Soyuz or progress, the, the position also changes. Another thing is the solar ray. Solar ray sometimes shade AMS. For the fly electronics for thermal control, there are, there are special electronics for 1,000 temperature sensors and 300 heaters. So we developed computers which are programmable from the ground for all the monitoring control. The transition reading heat detector and tracker has very special control system. All the others have a general control system. So every minute you need to watch the, 11, the 1,000 temperature sensors and 300 heaters. So for TRD, there are 24 heaters, six pressure sensors, 500 temperature sensors. For time of flight, 64 temperature sensors. For silicon tracker, four pressure sensors, 32 heaters, 142 sensors. So for electromagnetic calorimeter, the 80 temperature sensors. Here is the history of the temperature for the electromagnetic calorimeter on the starboard, ram, wake, namely the four, surf four surfaces, up and down, left and right. In June, 
2011, it's close to minus 10 degrees. In January 2012, it's plus 30 degrees. So temperature can change 40 degrees. And you need to correct them, because otherwise you do not have an accurate measurement. For the flight operation on the data acquisition system, to read out 300,000 channel up to 2 kilohertz, the MIT team developed a large set of computers which are programmable from the ground and read out all different sensors, but with 400% redundancy. Hundreds of these computers are interconnected in a tree-like structure with a 100 megabit per second serial link. What does this mean? So this is the data acquisition readout tree. So first, the detector have a data reduction. And then you have a serial link, which is 100 megabit per second. And this, th these numbers are redundancies. And then after data reduction, you have data readout. After data readout, you have a DAQ computer. And finally, you have a master computer. So most of the time, you have 200% redundancy. Sometimes you have 400% redundancy. And these are uh, DSP-based computers. So now, four times per orbit, each of the 300 DSP is tested for heavy ion-induced bit flip. Once per day, one fails. And so you have to reload the, to reload the software and restart the system. And to do that, you require detailed knowledge of hardware design, flight, software, ground software, integration, and configuration. So you've, fortunately, we've been extremely careful to choose the components. So every day, we have a bit flip, and we load the program automatically and correct it. And we have no electronics hardware damage. For transition radiation detector, which identify positrons electron by transition radiation and nuclei by DEDX, we have a gas supply system of 5 kilograms of CO2 and 49 kilograms of xenon. As you all know, CO2 is very difficult to contain. And that's why Coca-Cola doesn't last for a long time. And the leak rate, there's no leak rate. The leak is 5 microgram per second. It's by CO2 diffusion, because the people in Aachen really did an extremely good job for the TRD. And this gives you a, a lifetime, about 30 years in space. This is the proton rejection at 90% electron efficiency. Remember, at 400 GB, we have tested. It's about better than 10 to the 2. And in space, we repeat that, but low energy will reach 10 to the 4. So this now has become a major important thing for AMS. The time of flight system, at z equal to 2, measure to 80 picosecond, z equal to 6, 50 picosecond. DDX enable you to look for z equal to 26 with a very good accuracy. DDX measure all the nuclei. There are nine plants of silicon tracker on this on the ground. We measure the coordinate to 10 microns, and the DDX from the two sides separate all the nuclei. In space, this plane and this plane, the alignment over 150 days is stable to 3 microns. Now, to keep the silicon tracker function, you need to keep the temperature at 10 degrees. 
the outside temperature changes greatly. So we developed a cooling system, a two-phase cooling system. The blue line is CO2 in liquid phase. Red line is CO2 in gas and liquid two phases. So we have accumulator, pump, CO2, go to heat exchanger, and go to the tracker electronics and absorb the heat and become two-phase, go to heat exchanger, go to a condenser, and go back to liquid. This is easily said than done, particularly in space. It seems to function very accurately. We are very, very pleased with that. Nobody has ever done this before. So this stability of this system over four months, indeed, is 10 degrees. The re <coughs> rain image drunk of counter enable us to measure nuclei and in the TV range. And this is equal to seven, a two TV, Z equal to 10, a 0.6 TV, Z equal to 13, a 9 TV, all the way to Z equal to 26, a 0.8 TV. So we are going to study nuclear physics very accurately in space. We have uh, many, many measurements of uh, Z. On top, from the first layer of silicon, we do DDX, we determine the Z. Transition radiation detector, determine the Z. Time of flight, determine the Z. Silicon tracker, determine the Z again. Time of flight, determine the Z. Rain image, turn of counter, determine Z. And finally, the last layer, determine Z. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven times. <coughs> so this is... Uh, how a, a chunk of ring look like. The electromagnetic colorimeter enables us to reject protons over positrons order of 10 to the 4. On the space station, since it took a long time to develop a space station, some of the software on the space station was made in the 1970s. And so they are constantly changing their software. Every time they change the software, they require us to change our software. So what we have to do is we build a simulator fact, uh, laboratory at CERN. We do fly simulation, do space station avionic simulation, and develop and test facilities. So any software we will send to space, the first thing you do is test it in our own test facility, and then we test it at Johnson Space Center Software Development and Integration Laboratory. This is a very large complex, has hundreds of people with a very large budget, mainly to study software on the space station. And then we do it in Marshall Space Flight Center before we send to space. Over the first 18 months of operation, we have collected 24 billion events. <coughs> Fortunately, we have not experienced any loss of equipment or electronics. Each year, we'll collect 16 billion events, so in 10 to 20 years, we'll collect enormous amount of events. This will provide unprecedented sensitivity to search for new physics. I mentioned on the physics of search for origin of dark matter, collision of cosmic rays produce positrons. Collision of dark matter will produce additional positrons, which we can measure very accurately. TRD, 
identify positron, reject proton by factor of 100. Silicon tracker and magnet measure the energy of positron. Electromagnetic calorimeter measure the energy E2 of positron. And so a real signal, E1, must equal to E2. The, and measure 3D characteristic of shower, and this reject a factor by, re, by 10,000. So this multiplied by this, you have a rejection order of a million. So this is the highest energy electron ever seen. One TeV electron from space. So this is the front view. This is a side view. Front view shows TRD, give a signal, so it says it's an electron. Nine tracker measurement measure its momentum, so it's negative. Rich identify charge of the electron. The electromagnetic calorimeter identify the electron, measure its energy. So the first requirement, this shower axis better match with the incident direction. And this energy measurement better match with the momentum. This is a electron, this is a electron, this is a electron. And so you have multi constraints. And these are close to one TeV, electron and positrons. And these are the two dimensional shower distributions. Very soon, we're going to publish our positron to the electron ratio. This is very interesting because instead of flat, the Pamela experiment shows a gradual increase. And the experiment by Fermi also shows a gradual increase. Incre the ratio decreases because the positron production should be less with energy. Instead, you give a characteristic increase. These, of course, are rather big errors. For us, our error is this size at this point. And so in a few weeks, and there will be a, a paper shows our measurement. And I suspect it's quite different from this. No, namely, I guess. Uh, much has been said very elegantly about an search for antimatter. So, experimental work on antimatter in the universe, okay. the search for baryon genesis in the last 40 years for new symmetry breaking done in Japan, Bayer experiment, SLAC, Babar experiment, Fermilab, and CERN in future LHC. Now today I learned electric dipole measurement that of course is an extremely important experiment. Another requirement for baryon genesis is proton decay. Proton decay has never been found. In the lifetime, it's larger than 10 to 33 years. Up to now, no explanation found for the absence of antimatter. So no, no experimental reason why antimatter should not exist. What we want to do is to do direct search. You increase the sensitivity by three to six order of magnitude and you increase the energy to TeV. Now, this laboratory has done many very important work. And one of the things I know for quite some time is the existence of the new state from six, from six quarks. Also, there's a very impressive calculation by Professor Leppard and collaborators on the masses with QCD and they use UD and S quarks. So these are extremely important work. But the question we want to ask, it's a very similar one, and first ra raised by Ed Wheaton, and also by Jack Sandwise from Yale. The question is very simple. 
all the material on Earth is made out of UD quarks. In particles, of course, you have UDS. But all the material you have, a diamond, for example, is U and D quarks. Z over A is 0.5. The question is, is the material in the universe made out of U, D, and S quark? A U, D, and S quark could be a dense neutron star. And the, the characteristic of this U, D, S quark is Z over A is less than 0.1. And these can be very accurately searched by us. Now, to search for antimatter, to search for strangelets, to study nuclear physics, the first thing you need to do is to see whether you can see all the nuclei. So this is part of our measurement, less than 1% of our measurement of number of events from time of flight and from silicon tracker, you can see all the nuclei we can see. I think we now see Z you could have about 40. So you have to see this first before you have confidence you know what you're doing. <clears throat> so this basically is a calibration shows we pick out all the nuclei. A physics ex example of AMS is boron over carbon ratio up to TB. A precision measurement of energy spectrum of boron over carbon provide information on cosmic ray interaction and propagation. So interaction with interstellar media of carbon goes to a proton or helium or go to boron. And so in the disk, there's a magnetic field. And so when a carbon produced, travels through the magnetic field, goes through the galactic halo, and may turn to a boron and detect by AMS. And so what you study is diffusion, convection, re-acceleration, and interaction with the interstellar media involving fragmentation, secondaries, and energy loss. Let us see what we can do. So there's a, we have a multiple independent measurement of charge. From silicon tracker, for Z equal to 6, this is the accuracy. From TRD, from upper time of flight, from silicon tracker, from lower time of flight, from rich, from tracker. So we have seven different measurements. So here is the case of a boron. Measure seven times 5.3, 5.1, 5.1, 4.9, 4.9, 5.1, 5.1, and carbon. 6.4, 5.9, 6.1, 6.1, and so forth. So you can clearly distinguish boron from carbon as 3 GV. Similarly, at 20 GV, you can separate 6 from 5. At 200, 200 GV, this is 5 for boron, and this is 6 for carbon. No mistake whatsoever. At close to 1 TV, this is 5 for boron and 6 for carbon. Now, what are the background? How you control the background? Now, this is a case of carbon frag fragmented into boron and the upper time of flight with a rigidity of 10 GB. So on the top, you measure 6 from first plane, from TRD, 6. In here, you measure Z equal to 10. Means you have a fragmentation. And then the first, first layer, the second layer become 5, become, because it's now become a boron. And the rest are close to 5. So on top is 6, and the bottom is 5. So you know a fragmentation has occurred. So you can correct it. And this is how the rain image trunk of counter identify it is five. Another very interesting nuclear physics phenomena on the origin of cosmic rays. So this is the helium spectrum. Events per second per GV 
as function rigidity after TV. When the space shuttle, when the space station is near the, equa near the equator, namely magnetic angle is very small, the flux increases with decreasing rigidity. Because it is perpendicular to the magnetic field, it bends away. When you go to north, it becomes more parallel, so the cutoff becomes smaller and smaller. Finally, when you're on the top, there's no more cutoff. So you will expect a, cu a cutoff as a function of uh, magnetic angle. But the surprising thing is, it doesn't go to zero. There's a second spectrum. The most surprising thing is the first spectrum, the original spectrum, is two proton, two neutron. The mass is 3.65, it's helium-4. The second spectrum, the mass is 2.86, helium-3. So it's very curious. Uh, the universe, the Earth is uh, 5 million years old. Why is helium-4 and helium-3 are completely separated? And this is only at the low, low rigidity near the equator. The detector is a very, very sensitive detector. And this is the polar region spectrum. And this is the, uh, the black one. And this is the equatorial region spectrum. Last year, in Gen a year ago, you have solar flare. In the solar flare in the equatorial region, the flux increases by a factor of 1,000. And this we see within a few seconds, because we'll monitor this quickly. So Cosmos is the ultimate laboratory. Cosmic rays can be observed at energies higher than any accelerator. I will show you we observe nuclei to 10 TeV region. But the most exciting objective of AMS is to probe the unknown, to search for phenomena which exist in nature that we have not yet imagined nor have the tools to discover. Hmm? How come the last slide doesn't come up? The most important slide doesn't come up. <laughs> what happened? Ah, yes. So let me summarize my understanding of particle physics. When I start work as a physicist, the proton synchrotron and the Bruckheimer AGS was just built. Their original purpose was to study pion nuclear interaction to understand the origin of nuclear forces. What was discovered with precision instrument at CERN was neutral current, eventually leading to the discovery of Z and W. At Brookhaven, it's two kind of neutrino, CP violation, the J particle. Fermi National Laboratory was built in 1970s. The original purpose to study neutrino physics, what was discovered was B and T quarks. Spear, a slag, originally was to do EP scattering and quantum electrodynamics. What was discovered was scaling, psi particle, and third family of electron. In Hamburg, there's a 40 GV electron positron collider petra. Original purpose was to look for the sixth quark. What was discovered was a gluon, which Professor Lubesmeyer made a major contribution. The Japanese large underground experiment, Super Kamiokandi, the original purpose was to study proton decay. What was discovered was neutrino oscillation. Hubble telescope. The original purpose was to do galactic survey. What was discovered was the flat curvature of the universe and the existence of dark energy. So I've been wasting almost one hour of your time to say, we're going to look for dark matter, antimatter, and strange list. Hmm? <laughs> and uh, the most important thing is we have a very precision instrument function properly. And what are we going to discover? Nobody knows. Thank you.
Thank you very much for this excellent overview of the physics program of AMS. Um, questions? Is it allowed to ask questions? In a Jülich lecture, it looks as if it is allowed. Please. <laughs> so the question was, uh, how can we distinguish between secondary antiparticles that are produced in the instrument from primary antiparticles coming from cosmic rays, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. No, you can provide the answer. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, if you allow me to... Uh, no, 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 no. You cannot go back in the slides. Right? You cannot, no. Uh -huh. so, so I have to talk now. Okay. Uh, uh, this is a very important question. Uh, in my early days in Hamburg, I've been always doing real decay experiments. So one part in 10 to the 10, one part in 10 to the A experiment, you require few things. The most important thing is be suspicious of yourself. Something may go wrong. And uh, you always need a, a magnetic field, and you always need minimum amount of material so that doesn't become a source. And you, so beyond that, there's not much you can do. And this is why on the top, the material is very, very little. Because if you put a lot of material on top, you can guarantee you're gonna have dis discoveries, which is not there. But beyond that, I don't know what to say. We, we, okay, we made many, many checks on these things. Uh, what will be the lifetime of this excellent spectrometer? Uh, the lifetime, the permanent magnet, uh, will, I think, uh, probably 20 years, because that is the lifetime of the space station. Yeah. That's the lifetime of... There, there's no reason we, we, will, we will not be there indefinitely. The, the CO2 on the transition radiation detect, uh, on TRD, will last for 30 years. Okay, the, the question was, could we in principle refill? Uh, you have to ask him. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, no. Um, short answer is no. Um, well, it's an experiment in space, so you never know what's going to happen. It's different than a controlled environment in a laboratory. But up to now, after operation of two years, we are confident that the detector will survive for 30 years. And uh, to be honest, I'm 50-something, so <laughs> adding 30 years, this is, this is sufficient. <laughs> the question? Yes, madam. That there is nothing to improve in the detector, but as far as I know, that it's possible to upgrade transition radiation detector using the modern silicon detector. Uh, do you have a plan for R and D or for IMS three experiment? Um, Professor Shell is uh, among the youngest member of AMS, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, doing experiment in space. It's really quite difficult. <coughs> to get this experiment in space involving the White House, involving the United States Congress. Uh, and it's never been done before. And I would say probably we better stick with what we have now <laughs> and uh, collect data accurately. Our main job now is to make sure the detector is working. And so every day at five o'clock, we have a little meeting in my office to check what is going on. And if there's anything that we are uncomfortable, we will call Johnson Space Center, call NASA headquarters, because this, this guy's changing things all the time. And we need to tell them they are there to make sure we we can collect data, they don't suddenly move a solar panel in front of us. Uh, so, 
I would say we would be, if we are very, very careful, we probably will last for 20 years. You always have to worry something may happen. Yes, sir. A little question off topic. Um, I mean, it's not every day we see a Nobel laureate here in Aachen. So, do you have something to say to a young physics student? Uh, one sentence of advice to give to someone who has all the hard work still to do? <laughs> uh, I started as an engineer. I, my first year at the University of Michigan, I started as a mechanical engineer. That was a long time ago, before computers. And I could not do mechanical drawing. So engineering had to look at top view, end view, side view. And that's a no-no for me. So my advisor decided, said, well, you better try physics and mathematics. And that's how I become a physicist. I would say I know many great physicists in the last 50 years, um, mainly because I received a Nobel Prize when I was quite young. I think all of them has one thing in common. They are mostly concentrated on one subject. I, I know no one who is good in everything. Then the Nobel laureates in physics. And most of these people are very concentrated, very dedicated to what they are doing. Also, another thing, in physics, majority opinion is not always important. Because the advancement of physics is when you destroy other people's concept, you move ahead. And so, in, I think Professor Scheer and Lubus Meyer will, will agree with me. Almost all the experiments were involved in, and there's always a lot of people against it. But you need to tolerate other people's mistakes. I think this was a very nice concluding remark, especially for our engineers to learn that a Nobel laureate went to physics because engineering was too complicated. Um, so Sam, thanks again for this excellent talk.